This is your lecture professor, Kate Hussein. I know I met most of you on Tuesday, but just a reminder in case you weren't in class, because I know we had a couple of absences. Um, I wanted to walk you through the material from this week's lecture. I know I'm a little bit late posting the video recording, um, but I hope it's still helpful. So the first thing I want to draw your attention to is on the bottom right of the screen, it says section one, the nature of science and structure and function. So if you got a chance to look through the getting started module, you might have seen the course roadmap where it talks about different sections. So the first chunk of the course is about the nature of science. Um, so how do we go about studying science, using scientific tools, and then also thinking about structure and function of different components, different levels of organization. So things like cells, which we're going to talk about a lot today. The other sections of the course are organ systems, which is next, and then um, information flow. So those are kind of ways in which we sort or organize um, the course information. Um, and the reason for that is so that you can be reminded that this material builds on itself. It's not existing in a vacuum. Um, you're going to be kind of maintaining ideas and building on them from one week to the next. So if we think about how the chapters we're talking about today tie together, we're going through chapters two, three, and four. Remember when I say chapters, that's the OpenStax textbook. There is a PDF for you to download it on our course page on Canvas. There's also a link if you would rather open it in browser. OpenStax is pretty useful because it's a free resource, first of all, and you can also kind of click through the sections, look at additional study material, open videos. So it's a pretty handy resource if you have stable internet access. Um, if you prefer a hard copy, you can also uh, order it through Amazon. We can also work with DSPNS if you need it to kind of print that up in a larger format. So please let us know if you need any accommodations. So again, going through chapters two, three, and four today. In chapter two, we're thinking about how atoms and small molecules are the building blocks of life. They're one of the earliest levels of organization. In chapter three, we'll think about how they come together to form bigger molecules, so biological macromolecules and non-living viruses, so keep that in mind. And then in chapter four, we'll talk about how these building blocks and biological macromolecules form cells and how cells have their own set of unique properties kind of grounded in this idea of cell theory. What you should keep in mind from last week so that again, you're building on material you've learned, this idea of size and scale, properties of life, so what actually constitutes life, and the scientific method. Um, we're gonna briefly talk about uh, some different tools of microscopy. In lab, you should have become more familiar with the microscope. So some of this stuff will hopefully build off of your lab information as well. Okay, so getting into chapter two, the chemical foundation of life. At the start of every chapter in the slides, there's going to be a slide that looks like this where it has the section numbers that we're covering in the book, the section name, um, and sometimes I'll add in additional information about what you should specifically focus on. Uh, you should note that some of these chapters are kind of short, but others where they're a bit longer, I'm just gonna pick and pull certain sections that are most relevant. Uh, that means that it's not necessarily the best use of your time to just sit down and read the textbook. You should really make sure you use the slides as a resource. They will tell you specifically what sections you need to go through. Um, the reason I do that is because I think you are all really busy with school and work and your family life. Um, so it doesn't make sense to just ask you to read through a solid textbook without some guidance. I really try to make the slides a fair representation of what you're going to be expected to know in the course, uh, particularly for quizzes and exams. So please make sure you're using the slides, that you're watching these videos, and that you're going through on your own pace and reviewing the material in the slides and the study guides at the top of each page, as well as um, the individual study guides that are posted for the quizzes. 
So this is a slide from last week, um, thinking about these ideas of size and scale, different levels of organization. So remember that atoms, which include chemical elements, isotopes, we'll clarify those terms in a little bit, are kind of the smallest unit. Those come together to form simple, simple molecules. So in this example, we have carbon as an atom. The simple molecule is carbon dioxide. Um, carbon and oxygen are gonna come up a lot today. We have bigger biological molecules, like different proteins. Viruses, which are assembled from biological molecules but are not technically alive. Cell structures and bacteria. By cell structures, we mean organelles. Um, so things like mitochondria or lysosomes, uh, those organelles within our cells are roughly the same size as a bacterium. And then we have the much larger eukaryotic cells like this red blood cell pictured here. So we're getting kind of orders of magnitude larger as we're moving up this arrow. So we're gonna focus first on atoms um, and clarify those terms, elements and isotopes. Keep in mind that an atom is the smallest unit of matter that has its own set of unique chemical properties. So a key idea for today is not just, you know, what are these units, it's what are the properties associated with the unit as well. Again, tying together both structure and function. So we say that life is made up of matter, and what we mean by matter is any substance that occupies space and has mass. So when matter um, has a form, it has these unique properties, um, and it can't be broken down. Um, so we are thinking about it in the terms of elements. Um, so an element is specifically a type of matter that has a form that has unique properties, can't be broken down into distinct unique units. Um, so by that, we are kind of saying, you know, there might be smaller components here, but they don't have their own set of properties. So the elements that we talk about exist as atoms. Sometimes an atom can't exist on its own. It has to exist with another atom. Um, so some of these exist maybe on their own. Others exist as um, molecules. Uh, but either way, atom is kind of the simplest unit. Atoms are made up of smaller particles like neutrons, protons, and electrons. But again, it's the assembly of those smaller units that forms an element, that forms an atom that has unique properties one proton on its own or one electron on its own is important biochemically, but it doesn't have unique properties the same way that an element does. So when we're thinking about different elements, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the periodic table, the elements, or you've at least seen it before. Um, we'll get back to that in just a moment, but you should be aware of the elements carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Uh, a quick way to remember that is CHON, so carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. Those are very important components of the human body. So what this diagram is depicting is the percent of each element making up matter in a living human. So 18% of you is carbon, 10% of you is hydrogen, 65% of you is oxygen, and 3% of you is nitrogen. Those C's, H's, and O's are going to be very important for the biological molecules that we'll talk about later today. So when we're looking at the periodic table, we have to confer a lot of information very effectively. Um, so there is a specific way that we format this information. We have the chemical symbol, which is a two letter set. Um, in this example, we're looking at sodium. The Na comes from the Latin word for sodium. Uh, we have the atomic mass, which is reported in atomic mass units. We have the atomic number, which represents the number of protons. That's going to be important because the number of protons remains consistent. The number of, um, of neutrons is going to kind of fluctuate depending on certain situations. We also might have the full name listed depending on how much space we have on the periodic table. And then uh, this information is not always here, but in this example, we have some uh, information about the electron configuration. 
really the chemical symbol, atomic mass, and atomic number are the ones that are going to be most consistent here. So when we're looking at this periodic table, we see that there's some kind of trends here, especially in clustering of metals, metalloids, and non-metals. Um, so these elements are arranged according to their atomic number. They're sorted into groups based on electron configuration and also sorted into periods based on atomic number and atomic radius. Um, and again, we see those clusters based on properties of these elements. So when we're thinking about atoms, when we're thinking about those units of elements, there's a distinct structure. And you saw this image earlier in the slides, um, but we have the nucleus, which is a specific central region of the atom that contains the protons and the neutrons. Protons are positively charged particles. Neutrons are neutral particles, like their name suggests and electrons are negatively charged particles that are arranged in distinct rings around the nucleus. So sometimes you'll see electron shorten, shortened to a lowercase e with a minus after it. That symbol means electron. Protons is sometimes shortened to H+. Plus. So like I mentioned, um, protons remain very consistent. Oftentimes, atoms have the same number of protons and neutrons, but that's not always the case. So when we're talking about isotopes, things change a little bit. So isotopes occur when you have um, two forms of the same element that have the same number of protons, but different numbers of neutrons. So one example is carbon-12, um, which is normal elemental carbon. It has six protons and six neutrons, but it has an isotope carbon-13 or 13C that has six protons and seven neutrons. So that atomic mass number changes based on the sum of the protons and the neutrons. So uh, one thing that I want to point out is that when you're writing out the full name of the isotope, you write carbon-13, but sometimes it's shortened to 13 as a superscript and then C. So for example, here we have uh, 12C and 14C, so carbon-12, carbon-14. Carbon-14 is another isotope of carbon that's specifically helpful uh, in radiometric dating. So when we have something very ancient, like a fossil um, that is thousands and thousands of years old, we can use radiometric dating to figure out almost exactly how old it is. So in a living organism, we have a consistent ratio of uh, carbon-12 and carbon-14. So um, it, we can kind of uh, figure out how much carbon-14 was in there to begin with by looking at the carbon-12. Um, but then once an organism dies, the carbon-14 starts to leave the sample, um, and so it's going to reduce at a consistent or predictable rate. Um, so in this case, we can kind of measure the amount of carbon-12, measure the amount of carbon-14, compare them, and use the amount of carbon-14 left to figure out how old the specimen is. So isotopes have a lot of practical applications as well. Um, if you're curious about kind of electron structure, different orbitals, um, you are welcome to look through this video. Uh, it might be useful for chemistry or for other classes that you're taking, but you don't need to know it for this class for quizzes and exams. So what is important to keep in mind is that sometimes um, atoms don't have uh, these fully formed ring structures of electrons. They kind of have openings or gaps that need to be filled. So these different atoms might associate towards one another in order to maintain stability. They might share electrons in order to become more stable. So in this example, we have um, two hydrogens and an oxygen, and they are going to complete each other's valence electron shells um, by sharing electrons. So it says covalent bonds. That's a specific type of bond that we'll talk about in just a moment. But there's lots of different types of attraction between molecules or between atoms. 
So when we're talking about those attractions, those are what chemical bonds actually are. Chemical bonds are attractions between different atoms. When you build chemical bonds, it costs energy. And when you break apart chemical bonds, it releases energy. So that's important for kind of uh, a lot of different cellular processes. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is that there's a lot of energy carrier molecules in your body. Uh, you might have heard of ATP or adenosine triphosphate, where uh, it basically acts as cell currency. You have all this stored energy in these um, kind of unstable bonds, and popping them off or putting them back together is going to allow that energy to be transferred throughout an organism. So this ends up being very important for homeostasis. Homeostasis is kind of maintaining a stable steady state inside of an organism. They're important for cell signaling and for energy production, many different cellular processes. So those bonds come in a lot of different forms. If we have an ionic bond, that is an attraction between ions or charged particles of opposite charges. So in this example, we have sodium ion, Na+, and we have chloride ion, Cl-. So there's a positive charge and a negative charge. Those are going to balance each other out. Um, they're going to form a weak association. We also have covalent bonds, where um, this is a chemical bond formed by at least two atoms sharing one pair of electrons. So they're actually sharing the electrons. They're not um, just kind of associating with one another, so it's much stronger. So ionic bonds are relatively weak. Um, you can kind of disassociate them by pouring salt into water, for example. Covalent bonds, conversely, are very, very strong. So one thing to keep in mind when you're thinking about the overall characteristics of the molecule is that it's not just about the individual atoms, it's also about the angle of the bonds, how the atoms are held together. So we're going to be talking a lot about water in the coming slides. Water is a polar molecule that's important to keep in mind. Um, it has polarity because the hydrogens have a slight positive charge, the oxygen has a slight negative charge, and also the angle at which they're held together is bent. Carbon dioxide is a polar co or has uh, polar covalent bonds, um, but the overall molecule is linear and that makes it nonpolar. So the uh, angle of those bonds makes a difference in whether the molecule is ultimately polar or not. Um, the reason we care about a molecule being polar or nonpolar is most of our body is water. We have it in our cytosol, which we'll talk about in a little bit. We have it inside our cells and we have it outside our cells. And the characteristics of molecules and their relationship to water, whether they're polar or nonpolar, affects how they move through our cells. Um, so when we're thinking about different molecules, we're thinking about intramolecular bonds and also intermolecular bonds, specifically when we're thinking about water. So water has these polar covalent bonds, which we just saw. It also has hydrogen bonds that exist between the positively charged hydrogen of one molecule and the negatively charged oxygen of another molecule. So those individual hydrogen bonds are fairly weak. Um, and the reason I'm showing you this really cute gif of a corgi belly flopping uh, is because that belly flop, that slap when it hits the water, has to do with hydrogen bonds. So again, water has several or has two different types of bonds. It has the polar covalent bonds within the molecule because the hydrogen is slightly positively charged, the oxygen is slightly negatively charged, and they are at an angle. Um, but the reason why it hurts to belly flop, the bonds that you break when you jump into a swimming pool, are not those very strong polar covalent bonds within the water molecule. It's the relatively weak hydrogen bonds between molecules. So when we're talking about hydrogen bonds, we say that individually they're very weak, but they are relatively strong together. So those hydrogen bonds end up conferring a lot of very unique properties to water.
So water is very crucial for life as we know it. Um, it's very cohesive, it sticks to itself. It's also very adhesive, it sticks to other things. So when you think about um, pouring water on the lab bench or um, getting it on your windshield, it kind of beads up. It doesn't form an even film. And the reason for that is because it's cohering to itself. Um, so that high surface tension, that high connection uh, is useful for insects that like to walk across the surface of water. But in terms of kind of sustaining life, um, the way that giant trees can exist, the way that vascular plants on land can exist is because they're able to suck water up from their roots into their leaves using this property of cohesion. Water is also a solvent. So we talked about hydrophilic and hydrophobic molecules. Um, we know that uh, certain molecules are polar, some are nonpolar. So the more like water they are, the more likely they're able to dissolve into water. We say that like dissolves like. So water easily dissolves hydrophilic substances like this Alka-Seltzer right there on the left. Um, and it easily dissociates things like salt, so NaCl. It cannot dissolve hydrophobic substances. So when we look at those words, hydro means water, philic means that you like something, phobic means that you're scared of something. Hydrophilic means that the molecule likes water, hydrophobic means that the molecule is scared of water. Um, lipids and material like lipids can't easily dissolve in water, so if they want to move through cells, they have to be kind of shuttled around by special proteins. Water also has what's called a high specific heat capacity. It maintains a consistent temperature. So if you think about something like, or a location like the beach, even though it's pretty cool, it is going to remain that level of coolness. It's not going to have super high daytime temperatures and super low nighttime temperatures like Fresno would. Fresno is a desert. There's a lot less water here to maintain temperature. Um, and so it's going to fluctuate a lot in terms of temperature. Water also has a high heat of vaporization. Um, when water evaporates and those hydrogen bonds are broken, it leads to us cooling down. So the reason we're able to maintain homeostasis, regulate our body temperature uh, through sweating is because of water's high heat of vaporization. And finally, water is unique in that it becomes less dense when it freezes, so when it becomes solid, rather than more dense. So going from a liquid phase to a solid phase, water becomes less dense, which means that ice is able to float on liquid water instead of sinking down to the bottom. So if you think about all the aquatic life that exists in very cold places, the reason that survives is because the ice forms a protective layer across the top that kind of insulates the organisms living inside of these lakes and oceans and allows life to continue. Water is also very important um, in terms of kind of maintaining a steady state within our cells, um, so it's important for buffering. So when we're talking about acids, bases, and salts. Um, acids are things that dissociate into a proton and a negative ion. So in this example, this is hydrochloric acid. When you pour it into water, it's going to dissociate into um, H plus and Cl minus. So we have those H plus in solution, those protons in solution. A base dissociates into a positive ion and a hydroxide ion, so the OH minus. And a salt dissociates into a positive ion and a negative ion. So all of that can happen in water. When we say buffering, we mean these solutions that help maintain constant pHs by either using up or releasing hydrogen ions. Um, so this helps to maintain a steady pH. Um, all of the enzymes in our body have to operate at very specific pHs. Um, we're really dependent on maintaining a steady state. Um, that steady state might be different depending on whether it's our blood or our stomach or our skin, but we rely on buffers like water to kind of keep things consistent and where they're supposed to be.
So we talked a lot about water that is made up of hydrogen and oxygen. Remember, hydrogen is 10% of our overall matter, oxygen is 65%, and then carbon is that 18%. So that is going to be really crucial along with hydrogen and oxygen for forming the basis of macromolecules. So when we're talking about macromolecules, those are a specific type of organic molecule. And when we say organic, that can mean a lot of different things in a lot of different contexts. So you might be familiar, familiar with organic in the sense of maybe farming or different produce, organic produce. Um, but when we say organic in science, we just mean that it has carbon. So organic molecules have carbon in them and are essential for life, just like water. When we talk about hydrocarbons, those are a unique type of organic molecule that only has hydrogen and carbon, so hydrocarbon. An example of that is methane, which is the CH4 pictured here. Um, those hydrocarbons can come together and kind of form the basis for larger structures. If they exist as chains, they might have single, double, or triple bonds. We call those alkenes, or alkenes, alkenes, and alkynes. Um, you'll learn about that when you take organic chemistry. Uh, the number of bonds, whether it's single, double, or triple bonds between the carbons, um, is going to kind of change the properties of the molecule. They can also exist as ring structures or aromatics, um, aromatic hydrocarbons. Those are very important for forming amino acids, um, cholesterol in our plasma membrane, as well as sex hormones. So we also talk about functional groups formed from hydrocarbons and other molecules. Um, hydrocarbons make up the backbone of important macromolecules or biological molecules, uh, like proteins, lipids, um, carbohydrates, and uh, nucleic acids but then they have these other groups on them that confer additional unique properties. So some examples of those are hydroxyl, carboxyl, phosphate, um, sulfhydryl, so lots of different types of functional groups. In this example, this is the general structure of an amino acid. So we see the carbon that's central in the middle, it's attached to a hydrogen. We call that central carbon the alpha carbon. It's kind of the centering unit. Even though there might be other carbons on the molecule, that one is the central alpha carbon. We also have a carboxylic acid group, an amino group, and an R group. And so that R just kind of stands um, for this extra functional group. It's going to be unique for every amino acid, and it ranges from another simple H to really big, larger structures. So we can see that as we kind of change the functional groups that are attached to a central alpha carbon or um, a hydrocarbon backbone, we have different properties. So that was chapter two. I've mentioned biological molecules quite a bit, uh, specifically over the past few slides. In chapter three, we're gonna talk about what we exactly mean by biological macromolecules. So we'll start by talking about the synthesis of biological macromolecules and then get into carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. So when we think about assembling macromolecules, um, a macromolecule is a polymer. So um, polymer means a one large molecule, and it's made up of monomers, which are smaller molecules. So when we're thinking about uh, me metabolism, when we're thinking about all the chemical processes in our body and digestion, we're thinking about kind of breaking apart things into smaller pieces and reassembling them in ways that are helpful for us. So when you eat food, um, the example I always give is with an egg. Uh, you eat the egg and you break apart the proteins in the egg into little Lego pieces. And then those Lego pieces get absorbed into your body through um, your circulatory system and reassembled in ways that are useful for you. So when you break apart a protein, assemble it 
uh, inside of your own cells, you're not using that protein the same way that the egg did. You're rearranging it into a different format that is helpful for you. So when we talk about macromolecules, we're thinking what is the polymer and what are the constituent monomers? We'll get back to that in just a moment, but thinking about the process of this, putting together monomers to make a polymer, water is very important for this process. So uh, biological molecules can be put together using something called dehydration synthesis, which is a very general term for a synthetic process, so the formation of something bigger, um, in which a, hy a hydroxyl group and a hydrogen group um, are removed from the molecule. So we have an OH minus being removed and an H plus being removed from a different monomer. So OH minus from one monomer, H plus from another monomer, um, and those monomers are gonna hook together to form a bigger polymer. So dehydration because water is being pulled out and formed, synthesis because you're building up something bigger. So the opposite happens during hydrolysis. Hydro should make you again think of water, lysis is splitting something. And so when we have a big polymer and we're using water to split it apart, that process is hydrolysis. So a big polymer being split into monomers that's hydrolysis when water is used to accomplish it. So all of these reactions that are happening in your body, we need to start thinking about kind of how they actually occur because there's a lot of chemistry involved, but it has to be done in a way that makes sense for us. It has to be sped up. And so we are going to be dependent on proteins um, called enzymes that kind of catalyze these reactions and speed them up. So this diagram is what we call a lock and key model. Um, we have this structure function relationship between uh, the enzyme and what the enzyme is acting on called the substrate. Um, there's a lot of terminology here that we're going to revisit throughout the semester. So for now, just keep in mind that enzymes are very particular in structure. They're proteins and they speed up chemical reactions. This slide is extremely important to prepare for the next quiz, um, and it's good to know in general. Uh, this will help build up your language of biology and ensure that you are kind of keeping track of the building blocks of life. Um, this is really key information for you to know. So these are the four main macromolecules, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. So all of those are polymers. They're all these big structures that are made up of a carbon skeleton with unique functional groups that give them their special properties. Um, and they're also made up of those smaller pieces called monomers. So on the next quiz, I'm going to expect you to know those four different polymers, their constituent mon monomers, and then a function associated with those polymers. So carbohydrates are made up of simple sugars, lipids are made up of triglycerides, proteins are made up of amino acids, and nucleic acids are made up of nucleotides. I just want to point that out really fast and revisit that. The polymer of protein is protein. It's made up of amino acids. The polymer nucleic acid is made up of nucleotides. So that's a little bit tricky because there's a few different types of acids involved here. Students often get confused about what level of organization we're talking about. So kind of really make sure you know which one is the polymer and which one is the monomer. And so there's a lot of information on this slide and we're going to kind of unpack it and expand on each polymer, each macromolecule individually. So first we have carbohydrates. These are very important for building other organic molecules. Um, they form cell walls in certain organisms, which we'll get back to in just a moment. They're important for storing food and for providing an energy source for the cells. So monosaccharides are very simple sugars. Um, they're those monomers, things like glucose. Those uh, can get built up into disaccharides, so two sugars like lactose. 
And then when we have much bigger carbohydrates, those are polysaccharides. So we have something like glycogen, and these are really useful as energy storage molecules. Regardless of how many carbohydrates, how many small sugars we have, the general formula for a carbohydrate is CH2O, um, and then there's going to be repeating units of that. That's what that N subunit means. So moving on to fats, these are also called lipids. They are nonpolar organic molecules. So again, that means that they're hydrophobic. They don't dissolve readily in water. Um, they are, again, a very important structural component, especially in plasma membranes, um, as well as cell wall structures, and they provide a lot of energy storage. So what, this, um, what the diagrams on the right are showing you is, first of all, lava lamps, because that is um, a hydrophobic substance dissolved inside of an aqueous solution. So you can see that the bubbles of fat there don't dissolve readily into water. Um, we also have the plasma membrane where we have a hydrophilic head, but those hydrophobic tails that are made up of fats. So when we're thinking about the structure of lipids, those are made up of these monomers called triglycerides. So each triglyceride, tri is three, has three fatty acids. So these are those long hydrocarbon chains. Again, remember most of these really important macromolecules have these longer hydrocarbon skeletons. So we have three fatty acids that are attached to one glycerol. So that glycerol has three carbons on it that attach to those fatty acids. Um, and so depending on how the bonds are in the fatty acids, whether there's double bonds or triple bonds or single bonds, um, it's going to make them saturated or unsaturated. If it's all single bonds, it's a saturated fat, it's a hard fat like coconut oil or um, butter, where uh, they have these distinct set of properties. Something like olive oil is going to be more unsaturated, it has more double bonds, um, so it's not fully saturated with hydrogen. So there's different properties depending on whether it's saturated or unsaturated. There's a lot of other types of fats, so not everything matches that triglyceride structure very clearly. Um, a lot of hormones are fats. The, uh, hormones are molecules that are involved in cell-to-cell -cell signaling. Uh, cholesterol is um, really important in animal cell membranes. We often think about it as being bad because it's associated with heart disease, but it is essential for life. Um, so when you see those OL words, you might think about these ring structures, these fats, um, things like estradiol and testosterone are very similar in structure to cholesterol. Those are all different types of fat-like substances. Another example of a structure that is one of these fat-like substances are the synthetic anabolic steroids. Um, these are very similar in structure to testosterone, and because they are, they're able to help you build muscle, but also they throw off feedback loops. So your cells think they've produced enough testosterone, they stop producing more testosterone, and you end up with a lot of breast tissue and people with testes, a lot of serious acne, um, and a lot of damage to secondary sex characteristics, and there's a lot of health risks as well. Moving on to proteins. Proteins are the polymer. They're the bigger structure. They're made up of individual amino acids, and they're very elegant and unique in structure. So there's a lot of different levels to their organization. Um, they are held together using peptide bonds. So whenever you see that word peptide, you should think about proteins. Peptide bonds hold together amino acids to make a protein. So when we say the word dipeptide, that means there are two amino acids linked together with a peptide bond. When we say tripeptide, there are three amino acids linked together, and a polypeptide are multiple amino acids. So a polypeptide chain is kind of this first step to building up a protein. So here we have a picture of a sample polypeptide chain. You can see it's quite long with 129 different amino acids. Um, all forming this chain. So some of these amino acids might be polar, some might be nonpolar, 
Um, and so they have different properties that affect the overall structure and function of the protein. Um, so it doesn't just exist as this chain, it's going to get folded a little bit more. So we have these different levels of organization. We have the primary structure, which is the polypeptide chain, a secondary structure where it either becomes a helix or a folded sheet, tertiary structures, and then quaternary structures where we get an increasingly elegant structure. Um, and so you can start to see this idea where the shape is very critical. If anything were to happen to it, um, we have what's called denaturing, um, where it's a change in the nature or the structure of the protein that affects its ability to function. So at the top here, we have an artist's rendition of the enzyme lactase. That is really important for breaking down lactose in milk. And if you're lactose intolerant, it's because your body doesn't produce the lactase enzyme. So bacteria have to break down that sugar and you end up with a lot of undesirable side effects. Um, but you can see how really beautiful and elegant it is in structure. And if anything were to happen to it, that would throw off that lock and key relationship that we talked about earlier. Um, one thing that I want to point out, in biology, there's a lot of very similar sounding terms. Whenever you see a word that ends in A-S-E, that means that it's an enzyme. So it's a lot easier to learn the rules of language in biology than to try to memorize everything. Um, so lactase, ASE tells you that it's an enzyme. Lact tells you that it has something to do with the sugar lactose. Words that end in OSE are usually sugars. So things like uh, fructose, glucose, lactose. So again, learning those language terms. Um, when you're thinking about denaturing, and a common example of that, going back to the egg, um, is when we fry an egg or we cook an egg, the egg white portion goes from being clear to being white. And so what's happening there are the proteins that are in that egg white are being damaged by the heat. Um, they're being completely denatured. They're not able to function the way they used to before. So we talked a little bit about enzymes. We talked about that naming convention. Um, this GIF right here is a time-lapse video of mitosis happening in the cell. I'm sure some of you learned about mitosis back in high school or in earlier college classes. We'll cover it later in the semester, specifically during information flow. Um, but mitosis is how cells make copies of themselves. And here you can see that it's a very dynamic and very beautiful process. Even just sitting, listening to me lecture, your body is going through some crazy, amazing stuff. Just like every millisecond of the day, you have so many reactions taking place. So a lot of stuff is happening in your cells. And all of those reactions have to be done at a speed that sustains life. You have to have all these signals being sent. You have to be able to react to things. Your world is so dynamic and ever-changing. Um, and all of that is only possible because of enzymes. So enzymes are special proteins that reduce activation energy barriers, bring molecules together, and speed up reactions. So proteins are very important in part because they are enzymes. So going on to nucleic acids, um, so these are made up of nucleotide bases, these nitrogenous bases. When we say the word nitrogenous, that means that it contains nitrogen. Um, and so we have these ring structures where nitrogen and carbon are alternating. Um, you might have done activities where you looked at kind of DNA pairing up. Adenine is one type of nucleotide. It always pairs with thymine as a double bond. Cytosine always pairs with guanine. And so if you look at this image, the reason for that is that the structures fit together. You have one big molecule, one small molecule. If you had two big molecules coming together, that would create a bump or a kink in the DNA. So thinking about that DNA structure and how these nucleotide base monomers come together to make a nucleic acid polymer, we have um, this sugar phosphate backbone where we have these sugar phosphate groups that are attached to the nitrogenous base to form a single nucleotide. 
um, adjacent nucleotides are hooked together at the sugar phosphate to form a sugar phosphate backbone. Then the nitrogenous base kind of reaches across to the complementary strand and is hydrogen bound to that strand. So here we can see the, uh, the cytosine and the guanine at the top pairing together with three hydrogen bonds, the adenine and the thymine below it pairing together with two hydrogen bonds. And so remember, hydrogen bonds in a group are very strong, but individually are pretty weak. So that's gonna be important because uh, you can use enzymes to kind of break apart those hydrogen bonds, separate them out, and then use that DNA as a code for coding for proteins or making more DNA. So those strands have to be able to separate from each other fairly easily through enzymatic reactions. So when they do come together, they form what's called the DNA ladder. If you kind of twist it, you get this kind of like spiral staircase structure, this double helix um, that is the structure of DNA within our cells. So one last important molecule that is not one of these technical macromolecules, but is still very, very important is ATP. So that is adenosine triphosphate. Um, it's the currency of the cell. So remember earlier I was talking about how bonds are very important for kind of storing and then releasing energy. Um, this is what's happening with ATP. So we're moving energy around the cells. Um, we have those three phosphate groups and the last phosphate is gonna kind of pop off and release energy for cellular reactions. We're gonna go through these processes where we add the phosphate back and we have more ATP production. So ATP is produced by cellular respiration within our cells. That's this process of glycolysis, transition reactions, um, other stuff happening as well. So like I mentioned, ATP breaks down, um, it releases a phosphate that forms a DP, adenosine diphosphate, and an inorganic phosphate that's been separated out from all those other carbons that releases energy, um, and it releases a decent amount of energy because it's a covalent bond, which is very strong. Okay, so then going on to our last chapter, chapter four about cell structure, we're gonna start out by talking very briefly about microscopy. Um, I'm gonna kind of skim through it because you should have talked about microscopy quite a bit in lab on Tuesday. When we talk about microscopy, that will be section 4.1, studying cells. We'll go over prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, briefly touch on uh, the endomembrane system, the cytoskeleton, and then um, connections between cells. So in general, a microscope is what we use to see things that can't be seen by our eyes. And the type of microscope makes a difference in terms of the micrograph or the image that we see. So when we use something called a dissecting scope or we use scanning electron microscopy or SEM, that creates an image where we're looking at the surface and the 3D structure of the object. So here we have a micrograph of pollen and you can really see the topography or the surface structure of the pollen grains very, very clearly. When we use compound scopes, which is what we often use in lab, where you're looking at a slide, for example, or transmission electron microscopy, um, we're looking at a very thin slice of a 3D object. So you can move through different slices, but you're not gonna see the overall 3D look that we see with dissecting scopes and SEM. The dissecting scopes and the compound scopes are things that you'll use in class. Uh, SEM and TEM are very, very expensive and we don't have that technology at Madeira Center. But a lot of pictures in your textbook and in the slides will be from SEM and TEM. So when we're thinking about why we use microscopy, the purpose is twofold. We want to increase magnification. We want to see how big so or change how big something appears. And we also want really good resolution. So we'll get back to those definitions in just a moment. Again, thinking about magnification, that's how big something appears. So these two images might be of the same strawberry, but the one on the left is not magnified as much as the one on the right. 
the image on the right, you end up seeing a lot more details. You can see all those hairs on the strawberry. You can see the texture much more clearly, um, but you see less of the overall strawberry. So keep that inverse proportion in mind. Magnification on its own, though, is Everything. So here we have empty magnification. If you zoom in, but you don't enhance the image, you don't make it more clear, you can maybe see more details, but it's not enough context. If you zoomed in on a cell like this or on one of these tissue slides, you wouldn't see enough details to really make sense of it or gain useful information. So another goal of microscopy is resolution, how clear something appears, whether you can actually distinguish between close items. So this image of Batman on the left, you can't really tell where his cape ends and Gotham begins. It's a low res image. But on the right, you see all those structures very clearly. So if you think about a cell, the image on the left, you probably wouldn't be able to see unique cell structures like cilia, these little hairs that are kind of on the outside of some cells for movement. But on the right image with high resolution, you can see those identifying structures. So you need both high magnification and high resolution. Something to keep in mind, though, is that magnification isn't everything. You want to see certain structures and you can zoom in too far. And when you zoom in too far, you lose the scope of what you're looking at. So the goal is not always to get the highest resolution or the highest magnification possible. It's to get a good balance of magnification and resolution in order to see what you're looking for. So one type of microscope that I mentioned that you might use is the dissecting microscope. That's when you want some level of magnification and resolution, but you're not looking at a very tiny image. You're looking at whole um, organisms, uh, not individual cells necessarily. Um, you're looking at low magnification and you're using an external light source. So you could just use ambient light from the classroom, you could shine a, a light source from the microscope, um, or you could use your cell phone flashlight, but it's not the intense light that we see on a compound microscope. So those images, again, through the dissecting scope tend to be very low magnification. On the left, we see a leaf, um, so we can start to see cells, but it's a much broader look. On the right, we see a spider, we can see more details than we would be able to see with the naked eye, but not by much. So when we use a compound light microscope, um, it has a light source within the microscope and it has two lenses. That's why we call it compound. There's an ocular lens, which is in the eyepiece. That remains fixed. It's usually a 10x magnification. Um, and then there's also the objective lenses. Those swivel around, there should be a 4x, a 10x, a 40x, and sometimes a 100x. So when you're trying to figure out the total magnification, you multiply the ocular lens by the objective lens. For example, if you are on the 40x objective lens, your total magnification would be 400x because you have the 40x from the objective, the 10x from the ocular, 10 times 40 is 400. So we have this combination of the two. We have this compounding of the magnification. So this allows us to view very small slices of tissue or flattened cells um, and other material. So I mentioned earlier that when you zoom in on the strawberry, you kind of lose scope of the overall strawberry. So this speaks to this idea of field of view. That's the two dimensional area visible through the microscope. So for example, if this is our whole slide, this is um, a slice of a, uh, of a plant um, called a monocot, and you can kind of see these face-like structures on it. If you have a low magnification, you can see more faces, but if you have a high magnification, you're zoomed in and you see less of the overall surface. So as magnification increases, field of view decreases. This is kind of like if I were taking a picture of you and I didn't zoom in at all, I'd be able to see your whole face. But if I zoomed in on your nose, I would have higher magnification, but less of a field of view.
So that speaks to the two-dimensional aspect of microscopy. In terms of the three-dimensional aspect, we have what's called depth of field. So if you are working with a pond water sample, for example, um, or even a squash of leaves or something like that, um, you might be able to see some structures, but not others, depending on what layer you're looking at. So depth of field is the number of layers you can actually see, the distance from the nearest to farthest object that appears sharp in the image. Um, so the iPhone X portrait mode kind of speaks to this. Uh, if you just have the person in the foreground in focus and the background is not, that is a shallow depth of field. So portrait mode plays around with depth of field. Also, let's say that we're in the classroom and a um, giant is looking down at us through a microscope. If the giant can see all the way from your head to the bottom of your foot, um, that would be a wider or a deeper depth of field. If they zoom in and they can only see from the top of your head to your chin, that is a shallow depth of field. This is just um, some information about how to prepare a wet mount. That's like if you were to look at pond water, um, don't stress about that for now. Okay, so thinking about cells more broadly, when we're thinking about what we mean by cells, um, it's helpful to kind of look at this tree of life. Um, there's some organisms that are inherently multicellular that are made up of several cells. Um, there are some that exist just as single celled entities. Um, we are thinking about stuff like animals, fungi, plants, things called protists, uh, archaea, and bacteria. Those are all considered alive, um, and they're all based on this unit of a cell. But there are some things that we might talk about in biology that seem to be alive, um, but not are not necessarily alive because they don't meet these requirements of cell theory, which we'll talk about in just a moment. So when we're thinking about life, um, you might be familiar with viruses. This is an artist's rendition of the HIV viral particle. Viruses are acellular. They're not made up of cells. They're just a bunch of nucleic acids, either DNA or RNA, wrapped up in a protein coat. So they also can't make copies of themselves by themselves. They have to hijack other organisms and use them to make copies to, to reproduce. Um, this next image is going to have a lot of information. You do not need to memorize it, but it's showing you that in order for HIV to make copies of itself, it has to hijack one of our immune cells and use our cellular machinery to replicate. So existing as a cell and being able to reproduce are qualities of life. And because viruses don't meet either of those requirements, we don't consider them to be alive. So they're not made up of at least one cell and they can't reproduce on their own. So this brings us to the idea of unified cell theory or just cell theory that describes our understanding of life. So there's three tenets to cell theory. First is that one or more cells comprise all living things. There's plenty of stuff that exists just as one cell, but that's the minimum requirement. The cell is the basic unit of life and new cells arise from living cells. So cells reproduce, they give rise to other cells. All cells also share some characteristics in common, regardless of whether they're bacteria, archaea, fungi, plants, or animals. The first is that they have a plasma membrane, at least one plasma membrane, um, that outer covering that separates the cell's interior from its surrounding environment. They have cytoplasm, which is the cytosol and cellular contents like organelles and cytoskeleton. They have DNA, which is the cell's genetic material. So we also make use of RNA, but our genetic code exists as DNA. There are some viruses that only have RNA. They don't have DNA. Um, so again, they're not meeting our requirements of life. And finally, all cells have ribosomes. So these are considered to be organelles, but they're not membrane bound. Um, that distinction will be important in just a moment, but they're important for creating proteins from a messenger RNA code.
So when we're thinking about different kind of classifications of life, there are cells that structurally look very different from one another. And so some of those are considered prokaryotes, others are considered eukaryotes. Prokaryotes kind of uh, includes archaea and bacteria. Eukaryotes includes animals, fungi, plants, and protists. Prokaryotes are very, very tiny. So they're roughly the same size as the organelles inside of our cells, things like mitochondria. Um, so they're orders of magnitude smaller than eukaryotic cells. You actually have more bacterial cells in your body than you have your own cells, but you still look like yourself because bacterial cells are so tiny, there can be trillions of them and it doesn't take up that much space. So when we talk about prokaryotes, um, even though we have archaea listed there, we're usually talking about bacteria. Um, this image shows kind of the size relationship between animal cells, bacteria, and viruses. A bacteriophage is just a fancy word for a virus that infects bacteria. So you can see that bacteriophages, that viruses are even tinier than bacteria. So cells are very small in general, even eukaryotic cells, um, but there is a size, because there is a size limit. So we talk about the surface area to volume ratio. Um, in order for a cell to be successful, you have to have a lot of surface area relative to volume. So as you increase in diameter, your surface area to volume ratio decreases, which means that there is a limit to how big a cell can get um, because you have to have this room for exchange to support the internal environment of the cell. So we have organelles uh, that help us deal with this. So we can get bigger and bigger because um, our cells, well, our cells can get bigger and bigger um, because they have these supportive structures inside of them. Prokaryotes don't have those, so they have to remain small. So focusing first on prokaryotes, um, we have long grouped archaea and bacteria together because they share some structural components. Um, but uh, when we had only microscopes, that was a great way to classify things. As we have these massive DNA databases now, um, we're learning more and more about bacteria and archaea and how different they are from one another. Um, and even within bacteria, how different bacteria are. It's also tricky though, because bacteria don't just give DNA to their offspring, they swap DNA in a lot of different ways. So it's hard to study them structurally and it's also hard to study them genetically. So among the prokaryotes though, ignoring the whole genetic component, thinking about their structure, they have very specific characteristics. So all prokaryotes lack a nucleus. They have DNA, it's arranged in a circular chromosome, and it's kind of aggregated into this area of the cell called the nucleoid, but they do not have a membrane-bound nucleus. They also have a cell wall. We'll get back to that in just a moment. Um, some of them have an extra plasma membrane in addition to the cell wall. They might have a capsule, they might have other protective structures. Um, and they also have extra structures for movement. So things like flagella and pili. Fimbriae kind of look like pili. They're a little bit longer, but they're used for colonization, for forming biofilms, for infecting your gut, different things like that. Um, so these structures are important for movement, for exchange of genetic material, and for colonization. So I want to take a moment just to clarify something about cell walls. Um, a cell wall is just an extra support structure. It uh, is a very general term. Um, bacteria have cell walls, fungi have cell walls, plants and algae have cell walls, but all of those cell walls are made up of different material. Bacterial cell walls are made up of peptidoglycan, fungal cell walls are made up of chitin, plant and algae cell walls are made mostly from cellulose. So even though those are all called cell walls, the way that they're formed and the material they're formed from is completely different. So again, when we say prokaryotes, we're usually talking about bacteria. Bacteria and archaea are both prokaryotes. They're both found in our microbiome, in the community of bacteria that's on our skin and in our body. 
Bacteria, though, are usually the causative agents of disease. We don't know of any archaea that cause disease in humans. Bacteria are also relatively easy to study and grow in a lab. Uh, it's really challenging to grow archaea in a lab. So even labs that specialize in archaea have a lot of challenges kind of maintaining their stock cultures. So shifting gears and thinking about eukaryotic cells, those also have their own set of unique characteristics. Um, they do have a membrane-bound nucleus, as well as other membrane-bound organelles like the endoplasmic reticulum, chloroplasts, mitochondria, um, and they have DNA that's packaged into these structures called chromosomes a little bit differently. So I mentioned that prokaryotes arrange their DNA into a circular chromosome. Uh, we as eukaryotes have linear or rod-shaped chromosomes. We as humans have 23 different chromosomes. We get one set from one parent, one set from the other parent, and we have 46 total in each of our cells. So we may not have all those extra structures like a second plasma membrane or a cell wall or things like that, but we do have a very beautiful, messy, fluid mosaic plasma membrane where we have a lot of proteins embedded in it. We have receptors for signaling molecules, um, and we have this very messy structure that allows us to get a lot of stuff done with our plasma membrane. It's not just that phospholipid bilayer. So when we're kind of moving past that plasma membrane and getting into the cell, we have a few different contents. We have the cytosol. When you see that word, cyto means cell, sol is a solution. So this is the fluid that's inside of your cells. It's really important for biochemical reactions. There's a lot of ions there like sodium um, for the sodium potassium pump. Uh, there's a lot of proteins. It's primarily water. It's this very important biochemical solution. We also have the organelles. Um, you should be researching those for your next reflection. Um, they perform very specific functions and they're often membrane bound. We have the cytoskeleton, and, which I'll talk about in just a moment. And all together, that forms the cytoplasm. So that's the cytosol, the cytoskeleton, and the organelles all the contents of the inside of the cell together. So some of those organelles come together to make what's called the endomembrane system. Um, so within the membrane, it's a group of membranes and organelles in eukaryotic cells that are very important for lipids and proteins. They modify, package, and transport those fats and proteins. So these are things that might not readily dissolve in water um, and need a little bit of extra work. So there's very specific organelles that are in part of the endomembrane system. There's the nuclear envelope, lysosomes, vesicles, the ER, so rough ER and smooth ER, the Golgi apparatus, and the plasma membrane. So you should know that the endomembrane system is important for packaging, modifying, working with lipids and fat, uh, lipids and proteins, you don't need to know every single part of it. So I mentioned the cytoskeleton. Again, cyto means cell. Skeleton is a support structure. So the cytoskeleton is a network of protein fibers that uh, allow our cells to maintain a certain shape. If you think about muscle cells and skin cells and bone cells and neurons, they all look so different from one another. And part of that is because they have this cytoskeleton inside of them. Um, so we have things like filaments, uh, microtubules, actin, that all kind of come together to form this supportive structure inside of our cells. And what this GIF is showing you is a white blood cell chasing a bacterial cell through our bloodstream. Um, so you can see it labeled there. And then the white blood cell is going to move its cytoskeleton around from the inside. And that pushes out these projections and allows it to chase the bacterial cell until it finally comes into contact with it and engulfs it. Outside of the cell, we also have the extracellular matrix. So this is a bunch of proteins and carbohydrates um, that is really important for holding different cells together to form tissue and also sending signals, cell to cell communication through different receptors. So again, human cells 
usually don't exist individually. The example or the exception to that is kind of sex cells, so gametes, things like egg and, eggs and sperm, which do travel alone, but oftentimes cells are bound together as tissue. So in plants, we have these openings that connect cells um, and help kind of facilitate that coordination of activity within the tissue. So we have plasmodesmata. These are open channels that allow stuff to move through plant cells. A lot of students think that because plants have cell walls, they uh, can't really exchange material, um, but the plasmodesmata um, are very important for actually allowing that exchange to take place. The equivalent to that in animal cells are gap junctions. They are very similar in function. They allow ions and different material to pass through. Um, the difference is they're not just openings, they are lined with proteins, and they exist in very specific locations and very specific types of cells. The opposite of those are tight junctions. Um, those are found in our stomach, among other places they stop any material from passing through. So tight junctions kind of keep things connected together. Um, in our stomach, that makes sure that acid from inside of our stomach doesn't eat away at our tissue. And then there's desmosomes, which um, allow for a lot of stretching. So they're not quite as tight as tight junctions. They adhere adjacent cells together and they allow for a lot of elasticity. Okay, so that was the lecture. Make sure that you look over the feedback from the last quiz. Um, I will post the study guide for the next quiz tomorrow. Uh, if you have any questions at all, please don't hesitate to contact me. Um, the online reflection number two is posted, so please make sure you get that done by Monday at midnight and make sure you complete the quiz between Monday at midnight and Wednesday at midnight. Um, I know that some of you have already had some problems accessing the quiz, uh, so if that's the case, please just shoot me an email. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to deal with it through Canvas, um, and I'll try to, uh, we'll figure out a way for you to take the quiz, regardless of whether you can do it in the time frame or not. Just make sure you screenshot it if you do have a problem, so that we can kind of keep track of the error messages.